Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's your girlfriend Elungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. This video is going to be in two parts. A big shout out to the person that suggested this. Today, I'm reacting to the pagan origins of Christianity. So, without wasting time, let's get into the video. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are typically grouped together under the same umbrella of Abrahamic religion. This video is going to show that far from being a religion in the monotheistic lineage of Abraham, Christianity, in fact, has its origin in pagan cults. Christianity has the doctrine of the Trinity, in which God is said to manifest as three persons, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's compare this concept of three related divinities to different pagan religions. The ancient Egyptians had the trinity of Amun, Re and Ta. An Egyptian hymn reads, All gods are three, Amun, Re and Ta. Babylonians worship the trinity of Nana, Shamash and Ishtar. Hinduism has the concept of Trimurti, in which the supreme god, Brahman, is said to manifest as the three forms, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. The Hindu text, Padma Purana states, He who is that eternal god became the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. The Greeks had the goddess Hecate, whom they described as triple-headed and goddess of the triple ways. The Romans venerated Diana as Diva Triformis, which means three-formed goddess. A Roman poet wrote, O three-formed goddess, to thee I dedicate the pine tree. Northwestern European tribes worshipped a group of three female deities known as Matrone, which means matrons. Persians had the triad Ahura Mazda, Mithra and Anahita. An ancient royal inscription reads, May Ahura Mazda, Anahita and Mithra protect me and my building against evil. We can see that this concept of three related divinities is an ancient phenomenon which has been present in different pagan religions throughout the world. It's important to point out that the Christian trinity differs in its finer details when compared to these other cults. However, this basic concept of three related divinities is common to all of them and is fundamentally pagan. The Greek philosopher Aristotle had this to say about the mystical significance of the number three. Just as the Pythagoreans say, the whole and all things are delimited by the three, for end, middle and beginning have the number of the whole, which is that of the triad. Wherefore, we use this number also in the worship of the gods, taking it from nature as a law of it. In Christianity, Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, who is said to possess two natures, one divine and one human. This idea of a God-man hybrid is fundamentally pagan. Greco-Roman religions were filled with tales of gods procreating with human women and begetting God-men. For example, the chief god in the Greek pantheon, Zeus visited the human woman Danae in the form of golden rain and fathered Perseus, a godman. Hercules, also the son of Zeus, is another example of a godman. The New Testament states that the role of the incarnate Son of God is to be the saviour of mankind. The Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. The belief that gods became incarnate as men and acted as universal saviours was also common in paganism. Perhaps the best known example is the Roman dictator, Julius Caesar. An ancient inscription has this to say about him. Descendant of Ares and Aphrodite, the god who has become manifest and universal saviour of human life. Here, Julius Caesar is said to be a manifestation of the gods and the saviour of mankind. Another direct parallel can be found in the Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This statement that Jesus the Son of God 
is the beginning of the good news is also mirrored by another Roman dictator, Augustus. The birthday of the God has been for the whole world the beginning of good news concerning him. The concept of a human being who is a divine son of God, the saviour of mankind and good news was a sort of template that was applied to people of great power and authority. We've seen that the history of paganism is littered with such examples and the Christian conception of Jesus was just another incarnate God in a long line of incarnate gods that had preceded him. The early Christian apologist Justin Martyr considered a saint in the Catholic Church admitted that Christianity had borrowed its concept of divine sonship from pagans. When we say that the word, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union and that he was crucified and died and rose again and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing new or different from what you pagans believe regarding those whom you consider sons of Jupiter. The Gospel of Matthew states that Jesus foretold he would die and rise again after a period of three days and three nights. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Very early on, churches taught that during his three day and three night absence, Jesus descended into hell. The Apostles' Creed is an early statement of Christian belief. It states, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. These beliefs mirror an ancient Sumerian myth about the goddess Inanna, which states, From the great heaven, Inanna set her mind on the great below. Inanna abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended to the underworld. After three days and three nights had passed, thus let Inanna arise. The Gospel of Matthew also tells us that something extraordinary happened when Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, None of the other Gospels mention this astonishing incident of the walking dead. Only Matthew reports it. Let's compare the accounts of Matthew and Mark regarding the death of Jesus. Notice that even though Mark's account is virtually identical to that of Matthew, Mark does not mention the rising of the dead saints. If such a miraculous event really happened, then there will be no rational reason for Mark to omit it from his Gospel. Consider that the Apostle Paul had the perfect opportunity to mention this story when he was preaching to an audience that was sceptical about life after death. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul could have easily proven that there is life after death by mentioning the numerous resurrections that took place when the dead saints walked the streets of Jerusalem. He did not mention anything about such an event because it never happened. Flavius Josephus was a first century historian who was born in Jerusalem. Even though he was a prolific writer and documented much about the city, he also failed to mention anything about this most public of miracles. Even conservative Christian scholarship rejects the historicity of this event. The New Testament scholar Mike Lacona stated that this story is a strange report and literary special effects. The theologian William Lane Craig stated that, probably, only a few conservative scholars would treat the story as historical. If Matthew's story of the walking dead is an invention, then from where did he get his inspiration for such a tale? It just happens to be present among pagan cultures. The ancient Greeks celebrated a three-day festival known as Anthesteria, during which it was believed that the dead came back to life and walked among the living in the cities. The Roman poet Virgil wrote that when Julius Caesar was assassinated, phantoms of unearthly pallor were seen in the falling darkness. The Gospel of John narrates to us the following conversation between Jesus and his disciples. 
This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Here Jesus instituted the ritualistic consumption of bread and wine, said to represent his flesh and blood. Note the great importance that is placed on the ritual. It will I mean, this has some very, very good um, information and the comparisons they're making. Look at the goddess of Inanna and uh, Jesus' um, death. I mean, we really, really have to question ourselves. Why is this trinity so much um, put out there by certain Christian uh, sectors? I mean, don't stay blind to the truth. This just goes there to show you that certain things have been um, borrowed even from parts of religions that you won't appreciate. Question yourself, did Jesus really die? And the link between him and God being son, father thing, look at the way it's been explained here. I mean, this video has insane information. And the fact that at the end of Jesus, um, at least we have paused it where they're having the last supper he's talking of, of the bread being the flesh the drink being his blood if you guys watch uh, movies then you know how maybe what's his name I was watching it if you watched something on tomorrow but it's a DC comic thingy so something of legends of tomorrow when that guy took when that guy killed someone, he actually takes blood to give to the other followers of his so that they can live longer. I mean, guys, that's just insane. Very, very insane. We ask ourselves, is this really true? Go back to your, go back to your books, read how things um, were, were founded and figure out what you want to believe in in this world. So much information let me get back to let me get to the second part of this and yeah